This is Christopher Cernike hosting episode 3 of season 5 of the Current Topics in Science podcast. This podcast will address breaking scientific news in light of the origins debate and host interviews with scientists. Today we'll be speaking with Dr. Jason Lyle on the difference between astronomy and astrology. This podcast is available on the following platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Video recordings of the podcast will be uploaded to YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Today on Current Topics in Science, we have the honor of hosting Dr. Jason Lyle, Dr. Lyle is a Christian astrophysicist who writes and speaks on various topics relating to science and the defense of the Christian faith. He graduated summa cum laude from Ohio Wesleyan University, where he double majored in physics and astronomy and minored in mathematics. He then earned a master's degree and a PhD in astrophysics at the University of Colorado. In graduate school, Dr. Lyle specialized in solar astrophysics, and while there, Dr. Lyle used the SOHO spacecraft to investigate motions on the surface of the sun, as well as solar magnetism and subsurface weather. His thesis was entitled, Probing the Dynamics of Solar Supergranulation and Its Interaction with Magnetism. Dr. Lyle specialized in solar astrophysics and has made a number of scientific discoveries regarding the solo photosphere, including the detection of giant cell boundaries. He's also authored numerous papers in both secular and creationist literature, being the author of several books such as The Ultimate Proof of Creation, The Physics of Einstein, The Introduction to Logic, Understanding Genesis, Discerning Truth, Fractals, The Secret Code of Creation, The Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, and Taking Back Astronomy. He's also the host of several presentations, such as Cosmology, Evolutionary Model and Problems, and The Secret Code of Creation. And he's created planetarium shows, such as The Created Cosmos. Dr. Lyle has worked at Answers in Genesis, the Institute for Creation Research, and is the founder and the president of the Biblical Science Institute, and the host of the Discerning Truth webcast. Now, without further ado, good afternoon, Dr. Lyle. How was your day, and how are you doing? Uh, pretty good. My day's been pretty good so far. I've been getting caught up on stuff. I've had a pretty heavy speaking schedule, and so now I'm just trying to get caught up on everything else. So it's going pretty well. Thank you for coming on Current Topics in Science again. And now, since this is Current Topics in Science, we're going to look at this week's current topic, This is from an article called, How Artificial Intelligence is Changing Astronomy, on astronomy.com. The author, Ashley Spinder, writes, AI is also primed to make discoveries that we cannot predict. There's a long history of discoveries in astronomy that happened because someone was in the right place at the right time. Uranus was discovered by chance when William Herschel was scanning the night sky for faint stars. Vestro Slipher measured the speed of spiral arms in what he thought were protoplanetary disks, eventually leading to the discovery of the expanding universe. And Jocelyn Bell Berner's famous direction of pulsars happened when she was analyzing measurements of quasars. Perhaps soon, an AI could join these ranks of serendipitous discoveries through the field of techniques called anomaly detection. These algorithms are specifically trained to sift through mountains of images, light curves, and spectra, looking for the samples that don't look like anything we've seen before. In the next generation of astronomy, with its petabytes of raw data from observatories like the Rubin and James Webb Space Telescope, we can't possibly imagine what these algorithms might find. Dr. Lyle, what do you think of this current topics, and can you tell us what is the field of astronomy? Okay, so, uh, well, the field of astronomy, that's easy. That's anything dealing with uh, the science beyond Earth. So it's the systematic study of the way that God upholds his creation, and in particular, his creation beyond the Earth. And so it's pretty broad. It deals with anything with stars and galaxies and pulsars and quasars, anything along those lines. 
And uh, I agree with the uh, author of the article that you just read that uh, artificial intelligence can be very useful in making some of these discoveries. Artificial intelligence is basically algorithms, mathematical machinery that uh, can do some of the things that we would use our intelligence to do. And what and one of those things would be pattern recognition. Human beings are pretty good at pattern recognition. We can we can look at certain things and say, oh, I see an underlying pattern here. And we're pretty good at discovering that. Uh, some of that can be passed on to machinery, computers. Now, computers can't think and they never will. They have no consciousness, but they can do computations very, very quickly. And so some, some pattern recognition can be handled by an algorithm, and then it would have to be followed up by a human to check it, because there, there's no algorithm that can perfectly detect patterns. Human beings are good at that. We're uniquely good at that, and uh, machines aren't. But nonetheless, using computers as a first step to check to see that there's a possible anomaly here, yeah, that's a, that's a great way to do it, especially with the enormous amount of data that we have in the field of astronomy. So uh, computers have been very valuable tools in astronomy. I use them in my doctoral uh, research to find patterns. So I've, I'm doing that. I've been doing that kind of stuff for a long time. Wow. And what do you think of the fact that they said that they're going to be using raw data from the James Webb Space Telescope? I know several people are saying that it's made some interesting discoveries that have big implications for the Big Bang. What do you think about that? Yeah, so back in January, I actually made some predictions, uh, some creation-based predictions on what I think the James Webb Telescope would be expected to find. And in particular, I made three specific predictions. Uh, first of all, I predicted that it will detect galaxies that are much farther away than what the secularists were expecting. So I wanted to make predictions that are contrary to what the secularists were expecting. Because in their view, uh, as you look out in space, you're looking back in time. That's not exactly true, but I won't get into the details on that. But from their point of view, galaxies should stop at a certain point because you're getting close to the Big Bang and there shouldn't be any more. And they figured James Webb would see that limit. And I predicted that it won't. I predicted that the galaxies would continue and they would be found at distances um, in, in excess of what the secularists were expecting. So that was my first prediction. My second is that the galaxies they found at these, at these extreme distances would be fully mature galaxies. The secularists were expecting to see galaxies in the process of formation, stars starting to form and then coming together to form galaxies. So they would expect to see very immature galaxies, partly formed, not completely, you know, not fully designed spiral galaxies and things like that. I predicted the opposite. And then I also predicted that they will detect heavy elements at those distances, which is contrary to the Big Bang. The Big Bang can only produce the three lightest elements. Even, you know, I don't believe in the Big Bang, but this, if you if you buy the secularist view for the sake of hypothesis, it can only make hydrogen, helium, and lithium. And so that means the first star should not have any of the heavier elements. But I predict, since God created the stars, that even the stars at tremendous distances will have some heavy elements in them. And based on what we're seeing, it looks like those three predictions that I made have all been confirmed. And we're still waiting on some of the final data for that. But it looks like we are indeed seeing galaxies at distances, the secularists that we're not expecting. They are fully formed galaxies at those distances, not galaxies in the process of formation. And there is evidence that there are heavy elements at those distances. So this is something I'm going to write up here probably in a few weeks. But um, if, those, if, if those are confirmed, then that's really very devastating to the Big Bang. Now, will secularists give up the Big Bang? No, because um, they don't, you know, they, they don't want to bow the knee to God. And so no matter what evidence is discovered, they'll continue to believe in the Big Bang. They'll rework it to be compatible with the new data. But I think it's interesting that I, as a creationist, don't have to do that. The data just lines up with what I would expect. So that's pretty exciting. That's incredible, Dr. Lyle. You really do make this subject interesting. And by the way, when that article comes out, we'll put a link to it in the description of this interview. And as I mentioned in your bio, you are a Christian astrophysicist. I'm curious, what was it that got you into astronomy? And is the field of astronomy a big bad wolf of sorts that Christians should avoid? What got me in astronomy, I, I've loved that field since I was a little kid. And I think um, one of the things that attracted me me to that field is that it's so beautiful. Uh, I, I would see these pictures in these in these books, uh, astronomy books. I would get them from the local library 
I, that's what we used to have before Google. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I would see these wonderful images. This was before Hubble uh, came out, but nonetheless, the ground-based images, just stunningly beautiful. I mean, who could look at Saturn and, and, and not praise God? I mean, you just have to. It's, it's amazing what the Lord's made. And also the fact that it's so big. I mean, the, you know, you, this little gem Saturn, you know, in a telescope, Saturn looks like it's about that big. You want to grab it, stick it in your pocket, take it home with you. But it's nine Earths across. It's huge. And it looks tiny because it's a billion miles away. And so what a lesson in perspective. And that's something that just really excited me. Um, the, the energies involved is just very, it's just so big and so abstract. And, and uh, now, now that um, I'm thinking more along the lines of a Christian perspective, I realize that's because the universe declares God's glory. And so, of course, it's going to have all this beauty and magnificence to it. It's made by God, partly to reflect his glory to uh, those creatures that he made in his image. And I, it's a tremendous honor that we can uh, peer into space and see these beauties that the Lord made ultimately for his pleasure, but perhaps for our enjoyment as well. I think that's wonderful. So that's how I got into astronomy. Uh, is it something Christians should avoid? I don't think so. But I, there, there is a caution here because um, there are a lot of Christians who, well, I, I think of young students who, you know, well, Dr. Lyle, I want to do what you do. I want to be a Christian astrophysicist. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, but there is a caution because you have to go and get some education to do that. And at just about every university in the world that offers an astronomy major, it will be taught from a secular perspective. And therefore, you have to be discerning. You have to be able to recognize truth and error. You have to be able to look at what the astronomers are presenting to you and realize, okay, but they have a secular viewpoint, and that influences how they interpret the data. And there are some students that are very solid in their Christian faith. And they could go to a secular university and they can get the good stuff and spit out the bad stuff. And, you know, and I, I made it through that way. And, um, and that's great. Some students are not ready for that yet. They're not mature enough in their faith. And for those students and, and parents often ask me, you know, is, is my child ready? I, I, I don't, you know, your children better than I do. I don't know. Um, but parents have to make that decision and it would be perfectly acceptable for parents to say, you know, let's wait a few years Let's make sure that our child is, is trained in presuppositional apologetics. That's very important, that they have a solid Christian worldview and that they're not going to be easily influenced uh, by their peers. Peer pressure is a real thing. Adults are not above it or not. Um, so that, those, that's the caution is be careful. Recognize that not everything you learn in an astronomy class is good science. Some of it is stories about the past that are not true. And you have to be able to discern those true. That being said, if you can if you can get through all that, uh, we need solid creationist astronomers out there. So it's a very useful field and and a very enjoyable one, in my opinion. Thank you for clarifying that. You know, there's a confusion sometimes that happens. You are an astronomer, not an astrologist. I know sometimes people will confuse the two. So if you could, could you please explain the difference? What's an astronomer and what is an astrologist? How are those two fields different? Okay, they're very different. Astronomy is science by definition. It's something that's testable and repeatable in the present. It's the science. It's basically applying the scientific method to outer space, looking for patterns, uh, trying to understand the cause and effect relationships. And it's something we've learned a lot about, especially in the last century. It's amazing how, what we've learned about astronomy. Astrology is very different. Astrology is the belief that the stars mystically influence our lives, and in particular, the positions of the planets and what constellation they happen to be in uh, somehow affects my life in a way that's a bit mystical and in a way that um, cannot be explained in terms of a rational cause and effect. Uh, that, you know, Just because Mars has gone into retrograde motion, that has no influence on my life whatsoever uh, in terms of any you know, kind of practical application. Astrology can and should be rightly classified as superstition. A superstition is attributing a false cause and effect relationship between two things that logically can't really have a cause and effect relationship. So you walk under a ladder or a black cat crosses your path. And then later that day, something bad happens and you think, oh, well, the ladder caused that, the black cat caused that. No, it can't. Logically, it can't have any effect on that and that. And so that's an example of a superstition, which in logic is a false cause fallacy. 
Just because two things happened at about the same time doesn't necessarily mean that one caused the other. And science, the, the tools of science, very powerful tools that the Lord gave us to help and distinguish genuine cause and effect from things that merely happened at about the same time. And so I would argue that the the whatever constellation the sun was in when you were born, that has no effect on your life. And 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 but that's what astrologists would teach. They would say, you know, well, you know, you're a you're a Scorpio or you're whatever, depending on what you know month you're born in. And uh, but that how, how can that logically affect anything? And of course it can't. So it is, it is a superstition. Um, it's something that the Bible tells us we're not to be involved in. The Bible's very pro astronomy. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. That's beautiful. And uh, and the stars are to be for signs, seasons, days, and years to help us keep track of time. But we're not supposed to use the stars to to guide our lives in a mystical sense. The pagan nations do that. And it's something that God forbids in Jeremiah uh, chapter 10, verse two, it says that the, you know, the, the heathens look to the heavens, they're dismayed. We're not to be that way. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to look and say, Oh no, Mars is in retrograde. My life's going to be in ruin. No, it has no effect on your life. Not no effect whatsoever. Uh, so they're very, very different. The Bible's very pro astronomy and it's very much against astrology. In other words, so out of the two, only astronomy is a field of science. You know, actually, you and I are both Sagittarius, and then my brother is Aries. What I've always found strange is that sometimes you'll interact with someone who is, say, a non-believer, an atheist, and they'll say, I don't believe in silly superstitions like that nonsensical book, the Bible. Oh, but by the way, um, since your brother is Aries, I don't want to talk to him. <laughs> You know. It's a little bit of inconsistency there. They're buying into a superstition while rejecting something that is not superstition, namely the, the scriptures, which are history. Exactly. So I wanted to see if there was any so-called proof of astrology, and I wanted to see what evidence they had as their best defense. When I was looking at the website, astrology.com, I found that it advertised astrology as the way to discover the key to your unique life. This brought my mind back to the verse where Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Dr. Lyle, and I know you already mentioned a little bit about this, but could you please tell us more, what does the Bible have to say about astronomy, and how do we apply those passages? Well, the Bible um, gives us the initial reason that God uh, made the lights in the heavens, uh, one of them is to give light on the earth. Now, the, the main object that satisfies that criterion is the sun. The sun is what provides light and heat for life uh, to grow on the earth. We understand that. Um, but also the moon at night, it gives us a little bit of light. And then the stars as well, they give their light upon the earth. And they're to be for signs, seasons, days, and years. And those are all um, helping us to measure the passage of time. Signs, seasons, well, days and years, we get that. Uh, seasons, that would probably be intervals of time. It's probably not referring to, um, you know, summer and fall, although the, those are intervals of time. So they, they're included in that, but it's more generic passages of time. And then signs as well. A lot of people think, well, you know, see, there you go. There's signs in the heavens. Well, uh, only those that God specifically tells us are signs. There was a, a star that's associated with, with Christ that when he was born that led the Magi there. That's, but that's a specific, that's his star it's specifically associated with him. Uh, more, more often than not, those signs would be the signs that summer's coming. And, and for example, the Egypt, you know, the Egyptians look to Ceres to see when to start planting their crops and so on. So that's the thing that, that the Bible's emphasizing. The stars are to be used to help us to mark the passage of time. And they glorify God, of course. So there's, there's no doubt about that as well. Um, but they're not to be used. They're not to be worshipped. Uh, they're not to be thought of as um, controlling our lives in the way that God does, because they don't do that. God, God is the one that's in control. God's the one that owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The stars do not. And so that's why we're not to be like the pagan nations. Um, again, Jeremiah 10, 2, where, where they, it, they look to the heavens and are dismayed. They're terrified. We're not supposed to be that way. We're, we're supposed to look to God. We're supposed to look to, and as New Testament Christians, we look to Christ uh, in particular, who is God incarnate, 
Uh, we base our life on him. He is the way, the truth, and the life indeed, and not, and not the stars. The stars declare God's glory to be certain, but we're not supposed to use them to guide our lives. We're supposed to use the Bible to guide our lives. That's the one, that's the book that tells us how we're supposed to live. So just in summary, the Bible is very pro-astronomy. It's very pro-science, apply science, worship God, who is the creator of all these things in this universe, and appreciate the majesty he's built into his universe. By all means, do that. But don't look to the heavens and be terrified because there's, you know, of these alleged pagan signs. That's not what they're for. They're to help us keep track of time and to glorify God. They're not to guide our lives. Dr. Lyle, thank you so much for going over those passages from the Bible. So it definitely sounds like astrology is not for the Christian. However, an astrologist would object to these claims and say that there actually is good evidence for the practice of astrology which they claim exists independently of any religion. My Today's Horoscope has an article called Evidence for You to Believe in Astrology. They list the following two items as some evidence for astrology. Millennial Study. They say astrology has been around for more than 6,000 years. If a study lasted that long, indeed something true must exist in it. If astrology were just an invention for TV shows to go on in the afternoon, it wouldn't have lasted that long. And their second evidence lists as follows. They say kings, queens, and emperors. For centuries, kings and queens and emperors consulted astrologers before making important decisions and even deciding whether to go to war. If decisions that put the lives of an entire population at risk were made with the help of an astrologer, something important should be included in this study. Dr. Lyle, do you find these two evidences compelling? Are there any reasons for people to believe in astrology? I don't find those evidences compelling, uh, and I don't believe there is any good reason to believe in astrology, especially considering the God who knows everything tells us that it's bunk. So that's a pretty good reason not to believe in it. Um, but the fact, I mean, the two, two arguments they gave are it's old and lots of kings and queens have used it. And how is that in any way even remotely relevant to the truthfulness of it? Uh, some things are very old. By the way, I don't believe it goes back 6,000 years. Uh, it might go back 4,500 years because I think what they were doing at the Tower of Babel was probably astrology. The, the top of that tower, uh, a lot of some translations say, you know, let's build a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, but may reach is not in the Hebrew. It's a, a, um, a tower whose top is unto heaven. So the top chamber of that tower was dedicated to the worship of the heavenly objects. So astrology. Uh, it was probably what they were doing at Babel that God got irritated at them and 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 spread up the spread out the uh, people groups by confusing their languages. So the you know the one the one clear example we have of that God judged them as a result of it. So that's not a good thing. Just because something's old, just because a belief is old, doesn't make it true. The belief that the planets all and the sun all orbit the Earth that's a very ancient belief and it lasted for thousands of years, but it's not true. And we have evidence today that can that can refute that. So the idea that something's old, therefore it's true, that doesn't follow. Uh, if something's very, if a belief is very old, that just means it's very seductive. It's it's something that people tend to fall for, and uh, astrology does that. People tend to fall for it because of a phenomenon called confirmation bias, and that comes into the next evidence that they present. They say, oh, but you know, kings relied on astrologers. That's true, uh, and they're dead now. So I, you know, <laughs> I mean. It would have been a little more compelling if they'd made a chart and said, okay, here's the kings who depended on astrologers. Now, how did that war go for them? And I think you'll find that there's there's no statistical evidence that astrology has ever helped anybody. And now uh, people can cherry pick and they can say, well, you know, this, this particular king, uh, he consulted an astrologer, an astrologer and he won the battle. Okay, but you've ignored the 10 who, who obeyed their astrologer and, and lost. Right. So there's this tendency for us to focus on data that confirms our preconception and to push aside evidence that would tend to uh, disprove our preconception. That's called confirmation bias. And it's just a it's a very powerful psychological phenomenon in human beings that we are susceptible to. But it is an error in reasoning. Uh, there's been no evidence that astrology has ever helped anyone. And like I said, we know in one case uh, it made God mad to the point where he split up the people groups. So it's not something that we want to engage in. There's no good evidence that that astrology has done anything useful. There's every evidence it's a superstition. 
Um, and that it's just, um, just because two things happen at about the same time doesn't mean that one caused the other. And so I would encourage people to think a little more scientifically about these things. By all means, do it, you know, do a test. But I think you'll find that uh, the Bible's right when it says we shouldn't look to the heavens to be dismayed because God is the one that's in control of our lives, not the stars. Amen, Dr. Lyle. And if you don't mind me going off script a bit, what would you say to someone who is a practicer of astrology? And they said, well, Dr. Lyle, I'm confronted with what you just said. Where do I go from here? Okay. Well, I would, I would encourage, I'd, I would say, I would encourage you to repent because the Bible says you're not supposed to do that. Okay. Um, it, it's not something that's true. That something that you've been believing in is something that's not true. Uh, it's, it's God who controls our destiny and not, and not the stars. And so you need to ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins, repent, trust in him. Um, with regard to, um, thinking logically, I would encourage you to, to pick up a textbook on logic. I've written one. Um, and you'll see that the astrology does fall under a, a particular category of, uh, logical fallacies called the fallacy of false cause. There's a couple different forms of it. There's the cum hoc, agropropter hoc, or the post hoc, agropropter hoc, both of those. Um, as, would, astrology would be categorized under those two fallacies. So um, I would encourage you to think rightly. And that's, and that's something that's scriptural too. A lot of people think, well, why should I study logic? Because God gave you this wonderful mind and it is incumbent upon us to use it properly to his glory. And, and that's what logic is about. Logic is about using our mind properly to the glory of God, using our brain the way God designed it to be used. And that means not being fooled by these superstitions, which astrology is. Um, and so I would encourage that person to begin thinking rationally and to begin thinking biblically, uh, to, read, to read the Bible and find out what the Bible has to say about the actual purpose of the stars, to be for signs, seasons, days, and years, and to uh, declare God's glory, but not to control or guide our lives in a mystical sense. Dr. Lyle, thank you very much for going over these claims with us. I likewise thank God that he's given us these minds to pursue true astronomical science. And on that note, Dr. Lyle, what advice do you have for Christians who want to study astronomy at college? I know that you had mentioned a little bit about this at the beginning, but I'd appreciate it if you could look into what are some of the areas of research or the projects that you think that Christians, astronomers should be looking into now. Okay. Um, well, almost anything, if, you, if you're if you looking at it from a Christian perspective, it's going to glorify God. Um, but I, and, and I will just back up and point out once again, you got to be real careful about that because students go off to college and, and right now, all the colleges that I know of that have an astronomy major, even if they claim to be Christian, they present it from a secular perspective. I'm trying to change that. We're, we're, I'm an adjunct faculty at Master's University. We're looking to maybe get an astronomy program going there, but we'll, COVID has not helped. So we'll, we'll see if that, that goes or not. I'm not sure. But in any case, um, right now, you'd have to go to a secular university, make sure, you're, make sure you're strong enough in the faith that you can go through and hear some garbage along with some good science and be able to distinguish the two. Very important. Uh, that being said, if you're able to do that, by all means, there are lots of, lots of wonderful avenues to pursue in astronomy. Uh, in particular, some areas that I think are really interesting where we really need a good, solid biblical creations to look at it would be cosmology, the, the structure and, and cosmogony, the development of the universe over time and how that works from a Christian perspective, uh, in particular, a, a, a biblical time frame spec perspective of 6,000 years, and uh, stellar aging. How do stars change with time? The secularists have their ideas about that. Um, but I think some of those ideas are wrong. Some of them might be right, but some of them I think are wrong because they involve billions of years. Uh, but you know, how, how do stars age on the biblical time scale? Sometimes stars explode. Why is that? The secularists have their explanations. Well, they run out of fuel in the core and the next layer starts fusing and so on. Is that, do we really have good evidence for that? Is that really the case or is there a better explanation? So I think stellar aging and cosmology are two areas where um, I'd like to see a lot more. I think there's a, a um, there hasn't been much development there from a creationist perspective, and therefore there's room to explode. And so I'd like to I'd like to see those areas explored. But whatever the Lord lays on your heart to study, that's what you need to study. Really, uh, God often gives us this just just a passion to. There's just something that we find really interesting 
Um, and, that, and that's going to glorify God. If you study that and study it from a biblical perspective, it will confirm the Bible. There's no doubt about that. Dr. Lyle, we've actually now arrived at our final question. The Bible says that Jesus is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And what would you say is the take-home gospel message of the science of astronomy? Yeah, I think, I think that is the message. I think the message is that, uh, that uh, the Lord God Almighty, Jesus in particular, is the creator of heavens and the heavens and the earth. And so when we look out into space, and, and I love doing telescope sessions with folks where they get to see with their own eyes Saturn's rings and, and some of these beauties that are out there in space. And you, and you think through how, how big it is, how magnificent it all is. It really testifies of the glory of God. It really does. It tells us our, our God is awesome. The creator of heaven and the earth who spoke into existence. I mean, he spoke and all that leapt into existence. And even the way the Bible describes the creation of those hundreds of billions of galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars each, it's summed up in this little phrase, he made the stars also. And it just gives you a little glimpse of God's power in speaking all of this into existence. Just the power that's involved is astonishing. And that same God who made all those galaxies is omnipresent. His power is immediately available everywhere. He's beyond time. He created time. He stepped into history, and, and the planet that he visited when he, when he took on flesh was Earth. And he did that uh, to die for our sins. Those of us who will trust in him and repent, uh, he'll, he's willing to pay for our sins and uh, change our nature, change our heart uh, to love him and to obey him. And that, that is glorious. So the fact that the, this God who, who made everything cares about me to the point he was willing to die for me, that's awesome. And so I would encourage people to, uh, when, they're, when they're looking at astronomy, that gives you a taste of who God is. That gives you a taste of his power and majesty. And then if you want to see his mercy and his love, take a look at the Gospels and recognize the God who spoke all that into existence, cares enough for you. He's willing to die for you. If you'll just repent and trust in him, uh, you can spend all eternity with him, enjoying him and glorifying him forever. Dr. Lyle, thank you very much for your time. It was an absolute joy. And to our listeners, thank you very much for taking the time to learn with us on current topics in science, where scientific discoveries are examined in light of the origins issue. You can find Dr. Lyle's website, his YouTube channel, his books, DVDs, biography, and scientific research in the links in the description below. You'll also find in the description a link to the official Christ Jesus Ministries merch store, Please share and subscribe to the Current Topics in Science podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth saves.